Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you all for spending this beautiful Sunday afternoon inside, um, learning about the fantastic candidates running to um, hopefully bring real change to Harrisburg. Um, many of you were also here last week where um, we had the congressional candidates speaking. My name is Alyssa Packer, and I am one of the um, people on the leadership team of Capital Region Stands Up. Um, Capital Region Stands Up is a chapter of Pennsylvania Stands Up, and the organization has just officially launched with the Pennsylvania Progressive Summit this weekend, um, but the launch has been in the works for a while, and Capital Region Stands Up is one of the founding um, chapters. It's a merger of Pennsylvania Together, um, Keystone Progress, uh, Lancaster Stands Up, Reclaim Philadelphia, and a few other um, chapters like ourselves. So if you're interested in learning about how to be a member, become a member, um, Michael over there, one of our organizers in this area, has information. Uh, really, our group's um, job is to make sure that we empower people to feel like they have a voice in politics, to feel like politics can work for them. And we all know what we woke up, how we woke up feeling um, in 2016 after election night, and Pennsylvania was obviously a really important part of that, that decision and it was lost by 44,000 something votes and we as a group are determined to make sure that we're electing people um, who are going to represent us. Um, and we also do issues-based work in addition to electoral work. Um, I'm pleased today to introduce our moderator. Um, our moderator is Joe Powers and Joe has, uh, he actually moderated one of our first forums in one of these 17, I think it was, uh, in advance of the 2018 race. So we're glad to have him back again. Um, Joe is an adjunct professor at St. Joseph's University, but he also has a long um, political career in Pennsylvania. Um, he has been working in politics in Pennsylvania since 1964, did I get that right? Yes. So he's worked in the Senate and the House on numerous campaigns, um, the Lieutenant Governor's Office, the Department of Environmental Protection, and so on, and he's also um, appears on Face the State occasionally. So, welcome Joe, and I'll let him talk about the rules of the debate. Or, forum, sorry. <laughs> right. The first thing I have to say is, is if there's anybody else that's been involved in Pennsylvania politics for 56 years, I really question that person's sanity. <laughs> I know it has been a uh, very tough uh, witnessing some of the things that I have seen in Pennsylvania politics. Uh, a couple points here. First of all, I thank you to all of you for coming out on a beautiful day. Uh, and I thank you to uh, the people who set this up, uh, the, uh, the, all the volunteers that have organized these events. They need to be congratulated. And most of all, thank you to the candidates who are taking time to come and, uh, and speak to us today. We, um, Uh, a request, uh, please silence your phones if you have not already done so. Uh, make sure that uh, we do not interrupt the candidates with uh, ringing phones. Here is um, uh, here's how we are going to do this. And to be honest, we were still working on this uh, up to a few minutes ago. Uh, but uh, we are going to give each of the Senate candidates uh, two minutes to introduce themselves. Uh, we will then have three questions for the, uh, uh, for uh, for the 15th Senate District uh, candidates. And, uh, and then we will have questions for the 31st District House candidates. And then we will have questions from the audience for all five of the Senate candidates. You will see people wandering around here with index cards. If you would like to ask a question of the candidates, please flag them down and, uh, and write out those questions and we will select the ones that will be asked of the candidates. The, uh, uh, the introductions for the candidates will take two minutes each and there was a coin flip, I'm told, before the, uh, this event started. And so here is the, uh, the order that we are going to, uh, to go in with the, uh, with the coin flip. In, uh, in terms of the candidates, we will start with the 15th district, and Alvin will go first, and then uh, we will have George give his introduction, and then we will have um, 
uh, going through uh, John Bosha. No, I'm sorry, it will be Bateman will go first, then Shanna, and then John Bosha. So everybody understands that order. So we will start with Alvin for the two minute introduction. There will be a timer here uh, keeping track of it. Alvin, would you like to begin? <laughs> yeah, I'm working on the microphone here. <laughs> Good morning, Capital Region. Good afternoon, Capital Region. Stand up. How are you? I'm Alvin Q. Taylor. I'm a candidate for the 15th Senatorial District that covers Perry County, Dauphin County, and it is my pleasure to be a candidate for you to improve our community. I'm a person who uh, came here to this region in 1955. I came from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm behind three generations of tobacco farmers. My father and mother moved here at a young age so that they could have work opportunities, other opportunities for their children. I've gone to the school district of Harrisburg City Schools. I'm a graduate of Central Dolphin School District, the first year student from <coughs> Dolphin County Botech. I went to an HBCU in Richmond, Virginia, three years after entering and exiting the construction field. I used to build bridges and houses. When I went to school in Virginia, I went to a junior college in Lynchburg, Richmond, Virginia, Virginia Union University. I served as student body president. And I went to the School of Theology in Virginia Union which since has been renamed the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology. I've come here to let you know more about me and why I seek this position as an ordinary citizen, just like you. As my campaign says, I am you. We are dealing with broken government, and so I want to be able to share with you why I'm the candidate of choice. Thank you. My name is George Scott, and thank you to Capital Region Stands Up for organizing this event, and thank you to all of you for taking the time in this beautiful day to come inside and listen to us candidates. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces, but for those who don't know me, just a little bit about myself. I grew up in South Central Pennsylvania on a family farm and learned the value of hard work and the importance of integrity. I attended public schools, as have my wife and all of our children, and learned the importance of a quality public education. And I've spent my life since then in service, in service to our nation for 20 years on active duty as an officer in the United States Army, serving across the U.S. and around the globe. And then for the last 10 years, I've served the community in ministry. I'm an ordained Lutheran pastor. And I've got to see the challenges that people face in their day-to-day -day lives in our community. I, I understand this district and its people. And in 2018, during my campaign, I was all over Dolphin County, and, uh, and currently we live here in Harrisburg, or across the river in Harrisburg. So I'm running to restore integrity to our political process. I want to bring people together. And most importantly, I want to pass laws in Harrisburg that will improve the lives of day-to-day -day people. I want to make sure that we make people's lives better. So that means, once elected, that I will work tirelessly to make sure that we have affordable and accessible health care, to strengthen our public education, and to reform our state government. And in addition to that, I will fight to protect women's rights, to combat climate change, and to invest in our infrastructure and raise the minimum wage. You know, the 15th district, as you're going to hear about this, this afternoon, is the key to unlocking victory in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is the key to victory in our nation. So I look forward to our discussion, and I'm excited to serve the people of the 15. We will now go to the 31st district, and Rick Copeland will go first. 
Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for being here and from the Capital Region Stands Up. It's, a, it's an honor to be with you and have this discussion today. And I want to highlight, number one, I'm running because all of us believe that Mr. Regan needs to go away. And I'll tell you right up front, all three of us would do a better job than he will, and he has. Uh, but I'm going to tell you why I think I can be more effective as a legislator and as an advocate and as a representative for all of you and all the people of the 31st. And I, if you get a chance, when you go out, please grab one of my pieces of literature because it tells you a lot about where I'm coming from. Among other things, I'm highlighting everything to do about our children. So the first question for every government decision should be, how will this affect all of our children and their children and their children? And I know you know where I'm going with that. So on the back of this, it gives you a few of the things I've done. And I think all of these things, the point of mentioning them is they will make me a more effective legislator a more effective advocate. Among others, my education includes West Point, graduated West Point in 1981, then Princeton University, studied economics under a guy named Ben Bernanke there, some study at Georgetown, and, and building upon that, I'm a teacher. I've taught uh, for 24 years, not only at the undergraduate level, but at the graduate level for Elizabethtown and also for the War College and also back at West Point. So among other things, I've also served the community as a Rotary president, the Carlisle president of the Rotary Club there, particularly in 2012, being the lead for all Central Pennsylvania, thank you very much for 30 second warning, on, uh, on the effort for Superstore and Sandy recovery and relief. Also, I've been involved with the Employment Skills Center, I'm on the board there. And I'll just tell you very briefly, among other things, I read to students in our, in our schools. I'm on the school board, I've been on the school board for five years. And I've recently gone into some of our Title I schools and then gone to the doors and I see poverty and I see challenges. And the people in Harrisburg right now just kind of go, oh, everything's okay. Thank you. I think it's not okay. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shannon Danielson, and I'm also running for state senate here in the 31st district. Uh, I'm a middle school music teacher, so I see the struggles that our kids and their families are facing in and out of the classroom every day. Our students are afraid to tell their parents when they're sick or hurt because they know they might not be able to afford the doctor's visit. Our problems are not just academic. When I talk about school funding, I'm not just talking about numbers on a paper. I see the very real impact of the lack of funding from the state. We don't have enough teachers. We don't have enough counselors. And that's a big problem when our students are coming to us with unprecedented levels of trauma. Our healthcare system is broken. My dad is battling cancer right now. He is in, actually um, in the hospital at this very moment. And with the silver lining from my mom is that, well, at least our deductible will already be paid, which is $13,000, by the way. Um, you know, he's in the hospital, but the insurance will cover the rest. Well, where's that $13,000 gonna come from? We can do better than this. Um, so I feel that my team and I are in a great position to be the candidate to defeat Mike Regan in November. Um, we've worked tirelessly over the past two years because it's the right thing to do, not because we thought that I was going to run for office. Many of you remember that I ran for state house in the 92nd in 2018, which is in York County. I'm the only candidate running for the seat that has extensive ties to York County, which is a large part of the district. Um, I'm the legislative lead for my local chapter of Moms Demand Action. I participated in Emerge Pennsylvania, which is an intense program that trains Democratic women to run and win. I'm a member of Democratic State Committee and the Executive Committee for the Democratic Party of York County. I've been trained by Emily's List and Pennsylvania Stands Up. I'm a member of this organization. I teach full time and I have a five-year-old son. I feel that we need working people in the legislature and I am proud to be here on International Women's Day to carry the flag for women everywhere. Thank you. Good afternoon. Capital Region stands up. My name is John Bloja and I'm also running for the 31st State Senate seat. Um, I ran for the seat four years ago against then Representative Mike Regan and one of the things I challenged him in our debate was the Cumberland County Commissioners have signed off unilaterally on a Fair Districts platform. Will you sign off on that Cumberland County Commissioners unanimous bilateral platform for Fair Districts in Pennsylvania? And he looked me square in the face and turned and ignored me and went out with his closing statement. We deserve more out of our state senator than what we're getting from Mike Regan right now. 
one of the uh, one of the reasons I'm running for office is I'm a pharmacist, and I took an oath to protect your health care. My hand up, put on a white coat, took an oath. The biggest issue facing Pennsylvania right now is the impending coronavirus. You almost expect Donald Trump to go out and say something wacky, and he has. <laughs> Two weeks ago on Sunday, he said, uh, there's maybe six cases. Uh, five of them are already healing. We're gonna be down to one in two weeks. Don't worry about the coronavirus. A week later, last Sunday, the coronavirus was in six states. Today, it's in 32 states and Washington, D.C. Next Sunday, we have another debate plan. I'm not sure we're going to have it. The coronavirus is spreading that quickly that there's a message to get out, and I need to take this platform to get it out today to all of you. I called on Mike Regan to denounce Donald Trump's lies and say, this is what's affecting Cumberland and your counties right now. Stone silent. But I almost expected that. What I didn't expect was my two primary opponents also staying silent on the issue. That's why I'm bringing it up right now. Your health depends on it. My name is John Boja. I'm a pharmacist. I'm fighting for you. Thank you. Okay, we will now ask questions of the two candidates from the 15th district. We are going to ask them in alternating order, and since Alvin went first on uh, making the introduction, George, you will get the, uh, the first question first. The troubles of the Harrisburg School District have been well documented, with a turnover rate of 18% in 2018. One particular problem the district has had is with teacher retention with an attrition rate of 10%, over the first year of teaching and of 40 to 50% after five years of teaching. What can be accomplished legislatively to help the district retain its teachers and develop a cadre of skilled veteran teachers? Well, it is a very important question. As I said in the beginning, I'm a graduate of public schools. I'm a strong believer in the value of public education because I believe that quality public education is a foundation for not only a strong economy, but for a strong democracy. And that starts with teachers. Teachers are the foundation of the foundation. Um, just uh, last month, I was out gathering signatures for petitions, and I met a teacher in the Harrisburg Area School District, a team leader, actually. And, and we were talking for quite a while, and what he explained to me, he has more than 10 years of experience, but the reality is that the rest of his team is primarily first-year teachers and substitutes and the turnover is constant, which makes his job exceedingly difficult. And that's in part because Harrisburg School District has, has had a pay freeze for the past five years, and they have a new contract in place as of February that hopefully will improve that situation. But this is an issue across the state of Pennsylvania. What we find is since 2012, the number of teaching certificates in Pennsylvania has dropped annually by 74%. We have a teacher shortage in the state market. So we must address both compensation and working conditions for our teachers, not just in Harrisburg, but across the state. And we do that first by improving teacher pay and ensuring that the state provides the funding to public schools so that they can increase that pay. Secondly, as we develop incentives for teachers to stay in high need districts. And there's a number of options here, but one that I like is something called escalating loan forgiveness. For each year a teacher stays in a school district, they get an additional forgiveness on their loans. And third, we need to reduce the number of hats that teachers are being forced to wear because of lack of resources. So we need to make sure that school districts are funded so that they can have counselors, nurses, um, ner uh, other support staff, case managers to do that. At the end of the day, though, it's got to be a priority not just for elected leaders, but also for the leadership. And the good news in Harrisburg is that Dr. Samuels is in place and is making that a priority to attract and retain quality teachers. How in your response? I'm a product. I'm a product of the Harrisburg School District and also the Central Dawson School District. In 1960, I was in first grade at the Hamilton Annex, and second grade I was in Webster. We come from a poor family, but we always valued education. My mother was a home ec teacher at the middle school in Harrisburg. All of her students to this day, my mother's 89, they know her, they remember her. One of the things that I've learned with education 
is the key to a lot of opportunities that you have. Harrisburg School District is not like any other school district that's in an urban setting. You have a lot of challenges. When you don't belong to an area, in a sense, you know the community, you're a hireling. The hireling that comes to the school districts are offered a lot of incentives to stay, but the incentive is the fact that you love your students. We have high turnover rates in Harrisburg. We had them in Richmond, Virginia. We had them in Warsaw, Virginia, when I was a substitute teacher, when I was in grad school. It's not a problem unique to this area, but Harrisburg has a, a lot of renters, 65%. There's no rootedness there with the population. They may live in one side uptown, they will be in Allison Hill the next time you hear from them. And the next thing you know, they're in another school district. A lot of times people say sports is the way out, but your mind is the way out. As the United Negro College once said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Our teachers are our resource, they are our assets but we have to do things that will benefit not only the teachers, but also the students as well, because there's somebody sitting in there like I was, who was not the most talented student. I believe Alan will go first on this one. In September 2019, the unemployment rate for Dauphin County stood at 3.9%. However, for the city of Harrisburg, the rate was much higher at 6.2%. About 13,000 men and women. The 2019 American Community Survey estimated that 28% of the population of Harrisburg has income below the poverty level. What would you do to help city families get out of poverty and enter the labor market? In 2010, I worked for the U.S. Census as a partnership specialist. I was the team leader. Our job was to go into the inner city of Harrisburg and 17 other counties and find out why was there such abject poverty. We found out, first of all, they were not part of the population. A lot of the population, they just moved about in that community. We stopped at a store at 14th and Derry Street and we found out this one store had more people visiting it in an eight hour period than Giant did. These folks were really under the radar screen. One of the things we found out that you have to do is first of all, the parents have to be more accountable and responsible. We don't have jobs enough for everybody. Not only that, in Dauphin County, a great portion of the population comes from upper Dauphin County to Harrisburg. There are buses that come from Lancaster bringing workers into Harrisburg the rabbit line. We can bring in a lot of people. State government has a lot of people. City government, county government has a lot of people, but they're not residents of the area. We have to have incentives, not only for them to retool and retrain, but we also have to do something that can help them. Tax credits are good for corporations, but when you're a single mother with three children, it's hard for you to say, I'm going to go work an eight hour job and you don't have transportation. And you find out that the bus line stops at Jonestown Road and, and, and Lower Paxton Township and the jobs are about two miles further out. There has to be an overall incentive that has to be directed towards making our parents better parents. And then it'll trickle with the students. They do not have the same type of backgrounds as many of us have. So this is a pressing issue, and it's worse than the 28% that are living in the federal poverty level and below the federal poverty line. In Harrisburg, you need to look also at the issue of working poor, what the United Way refers to as ALICE. That's um, Asset Limited Income Constrained and Employer. And when you look at those two categories together, what you find is that 63% of the population falls into those categories. In the last month, I was at a homeless shelter in Harrisburg. I spent the night there with about um, 20 men. And the amazing thing to me was how many of them were actually seeking work. Some of them had jobs. They would get up in the morning and then go to their job as homeless men. 
it's incredible the barriers that they're trying to overcome. So this is a complex issue with a lot of causal factors um, that, that are leading to poverty and unemployment. One of the most basic ones is that the wages that are being paid in Harrisburg and surrounding areas are too low and that the costs are too high. There's not enough affordable housing, health care is too expensive, child care is too expensive. So the solutions as a state senator are to work with city and county officials to tackle those causal factors. One obvious one is raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. It's far too long. We've been waiting for that. Number two is create incentives for affordable housing. More than housing that's gentrification, but housing for actually everyday working people and working poor in Harrisburg. Number three is a reform healthcare to reduce the costs and surprise medical billing and make sure that we are reducing and controlling the cost of prescription drugs. And third, we need to take a hard look at any government funded contract in Harrisburg. The federal courthouse came in a $200 million project. You know how many of those jobs went to local businesses and companies in Harrisburg? Almost none. We need to make sure that there are set asides for local businesses, especially small businesses, and mandates on requirements that a certain percentage of the workforce come from the population in Harrisburg and the surrounding area. Our last question for the 15th district. One of the most pressing concerns of Harrisburg residents is gun violence in their neighborhoods. What would you do to improve safety of city residents in the Senate district? And George goes first. So in January and again in February, I went to an interfaith service on gun violence. The first one was at Goodwin Memorial Baptist Church and the second one was at the Hattie Mosque. And it was heartbreaking to hear the stories about people who had lost loved ones due to gun violence. In, in 2020 alone, there's already been four people killed by one gun violence in Harrisburg. Going back to 2015, the number is almost 150. Gun violence is a national problem. We all know that. And there are certainly common sense measures that we can and should take. Universal background checks, red flag laws. But for Harrisburg itself, we need more than that. So I remember at one of the services, Police Commissioner Thomas Carter spoke. And he said part of this problem is these kids either aren't in school or even if they are in school, there's nothing for them to do afterwards. There's no family present. There's no love, he said, in their lives. So we've got to create opportunities and support networks for these children and their families. We've got to support our local law enforcement to ensure that they are being paid and trained to prevent these weapons from coming into the city of Harrisburg. Because the, the trick is those guns are coming from outside of the city. Into the, into the community. And then on top of that, we've got to make sure that we're attacking the larger under, underlying causal factors, this unemployment that is systemic, the, the lack of quality education, and the lack of quality after school programs so that children have something to do after school that will give them a support structure and a network, a sense of belonging, and a sense of purpose. It's not going to be easy, but we can do this if we work together at state, county, and local level. I know the Harrisburg community because I'm a part of it. I'm an active pastor there on South 19th Street. I preach every Sunday to those who have lost loved ones. In 2006, I honored through a program our three funeral directors because they have gone out of their way in making funerals affordable, which they should not have to do, but it's a reality of our lives. Mrs. Grace Millen Pollard was one of our honorees. And I say to Grace because we were good friends and I would come over here to Camp Hill. And I would say to Grace, we want to honor you because you're doing something for children that will never get to know who you are. We honored her and we honored the funeral directors all at the same time. It's because we have an indebtedness to our young people. I buried a young man over there. His father was, his grandfather was a preacher. And he couldn't do the eulogy, and I did it for him. And I told him, you know, they're too young. But we had a crowd that would be four times what is here now of young people. And I expressed to them the urgency of now. But we have to do something. It can't come from outside. It has to be among us. Many times they have never experienced death except by somebody getting shot. 
I walk the streets of Harrisburg. I walk the streets where death has taken place. I go to the families. I like the Chief Carter, Commander Carter. He had spoke at one of our minister's conference on a Monday as our invited guest. And what he said to us was astounding. I did go to Goodman Memorial. I know the ministers of the area. I know the church people of the area. I travel and I talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. I see the gang members that are out there. You know them by name. So we have to connect it all together and make it work. Okay, uh, we will now go to the 31st district. Before starting with their questions, uh, a reminder, if you have any questions that you would like to ask the all five of the Senate candidates, please raise your hand. There are people who are wandering around here who will stop and pick up your questions and or, or first give you an index card so you can write the question and then pick up the question before from you. Uh, another point that I neglected to mention that, uh, that is important here for all the candidates, both for the Senate and for the House candidates, that if you do mention uh, your opponent's name, then we are required to give 30 seconds to that opponent to respond to what was said. So something to keep in mind as we go forward. Uh, for the 31st district, uh, I believe that uh, Shanna will be taking the question first. And so the question, the first question to the candidates for the 31st senatorial district, the lack of affordable housing for renters and first time home buyers has long been a problem in Cumberland County. For households making 50% or less of the region's median family income of $75,230, this is particularly problematic. Latest data from the Philadelphia Fed Reserve shows that the number of available affordable units for this income level has been dropping most recently to 67 units per 100 households. What measures would you work for in the General Assembly to foster creation of more affordable housing? Shannon. Thank you. Uh, I know what this is like because my husband and I experienced this. Um, we lived in Port Allegheny for many years, which is in McKean County, if you know where that is. I'm going to assume most of you have probably never been there. There are more elk than humans. Uh, and needless to say, the economy is very different. We had a three-bedroom home that cost us $49,000. We had a nice yard. We were on a quiet street. When we moved here many years ago, we both had to cash in our retirement accounts to be able to purchase a home. This is a problem that many folks in my generation face, whether you're working class, middle class, or even a lot of upper income folks, which I tend not to focus on so much because I don't know what that's like. But uh, this is a very personal issue. Um, I think there are a lot of things we can do at the state legislative level. Um, housing is five times the expense that it was for my parents just a generation ago. Um, I think one of the things we can do is work with municipalities and counties to stop restricting uh, multi-family dwellings. There aren't enough apartment buildings. There aren't enough places where multiple families can live. We've been in this bubble of single-family home construction for decades, and you can see where that's gotten us. Not a lot of um, folks paying attention to zoning issues and traffic. Trying to drive through Camp Hill between the hours of 3 and 6 p.m. is a nightmare, and it's not the, the homeowner's fault, right? Uh, but there aren't enough places to rent, and so I think we can work with zoning um, in local communities about that. We can also increase the state subsidies for affordable housing and work with landlords, making sure that landlords live in the communities or close enough to come solve a crisis when it arises. Uh, just cause requirements for evictions, stop kicking people out of their homes because someone else might be able to pay a little bit more. This is happening all across the state. Um, and then also increasing the minimum wage so that people can actually afford housing. That's a huge problem. Right, John, then Rick. So the, the best thing I feel we can do is properly fund the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Authority. PHFA is doing a great job. We're seeing some results from the work they're doing, but we just can't see the results completed because they're not properly funded to do so. Um, one of the things on the federal level that's been going on since 1986, what they call LIHTC, it's a low income housing tax credit. It's a dollar for dollar tax credit for landlords and investors to build low income housing. 
That's something I feel the state should fully fund, the state should get behind. Once we do that, then we should be able to find more low-income housing <coughs> statewide. Uh, it's a solution. There is a problem, there is a solution. We just need proper funding to solve it. Thank you very much. Excellent question, and it impacts not only low-income folks, but also workforce folks, working-class people of all stripes, and it's critically important that we solve this. And this will give you an indication of where I'm coming from on a wide range of issues. And that is, yes, I agree with everything you just heard from everyone else regarding things that the state can do. But this is a sort of an issue which really requires community-based partnerships to make these sorts of things happen. And I had a great experience. My wife is with me, and just a couple weeks ago, we teach for Elizabethtown College, and we did a course called Elections 2020 from Central PA to 1600 PA Avenue. Part of that was affordable housing. One of the student groups did, a, did an exercise and a presentation on affordable housing. And what they came up with was brilliant. And this is what I'm thinking and talking about with regard to community-based and letting people really bubble up with these sorts of things. They came up with an idea of, hey, there's an old hospital that's abandoned. Let's take that. Let's get businesses involved. Let's get community leaders involved. Let's turn it into affordable housing. Let's put a child care center in that. Let's do a, let's do a job training in that facility. Just absolutely brilliant. So those are the sorts of things, and that's the way I look at every single issue that we face. There are things that the state government can do. Some of them have just been mentioned. Again, I agree with those. But what we're really looking for is a commitment from the people, our people, us, to actually do something about these things. Because legislation can only go so far. Dictation can only go so far. I also want to highlight that what it hopefully gives you is an indication of, I view government, the role of government is as a catalyst, not as a director, not as a dictator, not as simply taxing and spending our money, but as a catalyst working with some of these community organizations to do exactly the sorts of things that I just described. Thank you very much. For the next question, the order will be John Reglin Shannon. So, uh, John, would you work to ban or reduce common single-use plastics, food containers, plastic bags, plastic bottle, water bottles, etc., organic and food waste and e-waste? And as I drink up this single-use plastic container, absolutely I would. <laughs> Let me explain though. So in, uh, in San Mateo County in California, there was a lawsuit that was brought two weeks ago from a, a, an outfit called Earth Island Initiative. And they're suing Coke, Pepsi, Nestle, uh, 10 major manufacturers of single-use plastic containers. Uh, the lawsuit alleges that those 10 companies are producing bottles that get into the ocean at a rate of eight to 20 million tons of plastic per year. And they're finding fault with those corporations for not offering enough recycling initiatives and not offering a solution other than single-use plastic bottles. That's where we need to come in. We need to work with these corporations to find a solution, to find something other than a single-use plastic bottle. Something I didn't realize was even though there's a little recycling logo right on there, only five to 10% of these bottles get recycled. That, that was stunning to me. Uh, I, I thought there was more of a movement than that. Turns out, no, 90 to 95% are just being thrown out and it eventually ends up in the ocean. It's a concern, it's a problem. Uh, by 2050, there will be more biomass of plastic bottles in the ocean than fish. So we absolutely need to come up with a solution and we need to come up with a solution quickly. That's why I'm calling for support on Senate Bill 600 and 630. Uh, in addition to that, we also need to find renewable sources of energy and Senate Bill 600 and 630 will get us there partially in 10 years and completely in 30 years. So by 2050, all we have is renewable energy sources. That would be the solution I would work towards. All right, thank you very much. I want to highlight, obviously this is a critically important issue. I'm sure we all agree on that. And one of the things that I've highlighted in my platform, and again, hopefully you'll grab one of these, is I'm talking about people building priorities. And one of them is absolutely, we need a habitable environment, and we all know what that means, among others. You know, let's do everything we can to fight climate change, but also with clean air and water. So this goes directly to that. And what I want to highlight, among other things, is none of these issues are as simple as 
a, a single ban on one specific item is going to solve the problem. We all recognize that there are much greater, there's much greater complexity here. And one of the things I've learned as I've learned more about this is that without question, a ban or a reduction of plastic bags and plastic bottles, yes, is critically important and something that I support in concept. But we have to be careful about the way we do these things at the state level and at the national level because I've read of certain examples where some localities and some states have done these bans. They've not done them carefully enough. And guess what? Businesses find ways around them. Instead of a simple plastic bag, guess what they did? In some cases, they increased the density and the thickness of that bag and suddenly got around that loophole. So you see where I'm going with that. In other words, all these issues are, are complex issues. I also want to highlight the same fundamental concept that I was talking about a minute ago, is that I don't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers. And part of the, what I will do as a state senator, I'm sure, tell me if you've ever seen this before state senator with a whiteboard and stickies in the hands of citizens and, and, note, and note cards and, and markers having a conversation and getting the brilliance of the people up on the board to work with in terms of legislation. Have you ever seen that at the state level legislator? Well, you will if I'm elected. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Obviously, I think we all agree that we need to be moving away from our reliance on the petrochemical industry. Um, I don't think there's anyone who's serious about making progress when it comes to the environment that thinks otherwise. Um, I know that there's a lot of concern about what that does to jobs, and I think that when there's a will, there's a way, and we can figure this out. Um, plastic waste doesn't go away, you've heard this before, and we could do a much better job incentivizing recycling. Uh, I think every time I take out my recycling can and I see that pen waste logo, um, I remember reading when Scott Wagner was running for governor about how they just weren't really able to send any recycling anymore because China wasn't taking it. Well, why can't we do something about that here? We have brilliant people in Pennsylvania and across the country who could be working to find solutions. They probably are already doing this, but the government is not putting our tax credits into those innovations. We're putting them back into the petrochemical industry, which is why we are in this mess to begin with. Um, I believe very strongly in building coalitions with folks. The environmental groups are already doing incredible work on this issue. Having relationships with them, I think, is vital as a state legislator, and that's what I would be looking to continue. Um, I think education initiatives could go a long way for consumers, making sure that folks know that even though it has that triangle on it, if you don't prepare it for recycling properly, it's just going to be thrown away, um, certainly preventing private industry from skirting loopholes, but the way we get around loopholes is just making sure that the legislation we pass is strong and bold and that we are taking this issue incredibly seriously. Um, I know e-waste is a relatively new thing the last couple of decades, but one day a month you can take your electronics to be recycled in the city of York. For me, I live in Dillsburg, that's quite a hike. Um, and so we should be doing much better uh, community building and working with our county governments to take care of things like that. Okay, for the last question, and we will go back to the beginning with, uh, with Rick uh, starting. So it is a general question. What do you see as the three most pressing issues for the 31st Senatorial District? Thank you very much. Another excellent question. I will highlight once again, if you go and grab one of my cards on the way out, it's got the website on it as well. It has what I think are the three most important, critically uh, desperate issues that we need to deal with. And they're all about, I'll call them again, people building programs. And I'm highlighting first and foremost, strengthen our public schools and make them safer. Increase state level funding for public education and job training programs. And I've worked with that and seen that firsthand as a school board member in Carlisle for five years. And I've been very outspoken about, hey, the state doesn't do its fair share of funding public education. For me, that is probably my highest priority, to get the state to do the right thing with regard to fully funding and fairly funding all of our school districts and solving the PISERS problem, and y'all know what I'm talking about. So I won't spend any more time on that. I will just highlight other things, creating new jobs with family sustaining wages. That's all about economic development and the minimum wage. That's clearly been mentioned here today. I'm a strong supporter of increasing the minimum wage. 
I'd love to show you lots of charts and graphs for the economics of that, but I won't. I'll just say, number one, it's the right thing to do morally. Number two, it works economically. And of course, you can find studies, and the Republicans are great at finding studies that say it doesn't work, it cuts jobs and all that. There are other studies that say otherwise. But I'll ask you very simply, if you get a pay raise, what do you do with it? We're all great Americans. We spend a good bit of it. And that reverberates around the local economy and clearly raises the economic robustness of that locality and gets us more jobs. So those are the sorts of things that I think are important in that regard. And I already mentioned my third pillar with regard to people building is what can we do to improve our environment, to improve the cleanliness of the water that we drink and the air that our children breathe, not only today, but 50 to 70 years from now. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I don't know that you'll find many differences on policy among the three of us. I am a public school teacher. I became interested in politics because I graduated from a state university in 2008, which was a phenomenal time to be looking for a job, if you remember what happened in the fall of 2008. Um, I'm a public school teacher, and it's not about numbers on a page, and it's not about where we rank this and we are this percentage of that. It's about the real suffering that our kids are enduring because the state legislature refuses to act. The state should be funding education at 50%, and they're below 30. You uh, might know that your property tax bills are crazy, and everyone wants to talk about property taxes in this district. That's a huge issue for folks, and it ties directly into state education funding. Your property taxes go down when the state pays its fair share. That's number one. Number two is healthcare costs. I am not a doctor, but I know that our doctors are spending way too much time on billing and not enough time with patients. I mentioned this before, my dad is fighting cancer right now, their deductible is inhuman, and it's not even the worst that I've heard. I want my dad's doctors to give him the, the best care possible, the care that he deserves and that every member of our families and our communities deserve, but they spend a ridiculous amount of time on paperwork. We can bring health care costs down and work to make sure that every resident of Pennsylvania has affordable health care. Don't talk to me about accessible health care. There are a ton of hospitals around here. That doesn't mean we can access them when we need it because we're afraid of the bill. And of course, we need to focus on the environment. If I get another uh, weather channel alert about the air quality around here, I'm going to scream, but this is the reality that we're in. There are things we can do, sound, safe environmental policy to clean our air and water because my five-year-old deserves to live here a long, happy life without healthcare scares because we failed to act. Thank you. The three biggest issues I feel facing Cumberland and York counties, healthcare, education, and fair districts. Uh, healthcare, I can tell you, as a pharmacist, we need to increase the access to healthcare. Uh, not just the hospitals that are popping up, but we need more rural clinics to pop up. Uh, just living in a more rural area, which is 90% of Cumberland and York County, this district, just living in a certain area, living in a certain zip code, shouldn't determine whether or not you live or die due to a heart attack or stroke. You need access to health care where you live. Uh, that's something that I know there's legislation that's out there allowing registered nurses to do more, allowing nurse practitioners to do more, allowing pharmacists to do more. And we need to embrace legislation like that to provide more health care. Uh, second thing is education. I was fortunate enough to serve a term on the school board at East Penfor Area School District. It was I, when I got there, Governor Corbett was still the governor and you heard about his $2 billion worth of draconian cuts to statewide public education over his one term in office, and thank God it was one term. Thankfully, Wolf came in uh, while I was there on the school board, and we were able to properly fund East Pennsboro public education. Uh, we were able to restore full day kindergarten. We were able to restore additional language studies. We were able to do things that a public school should be doing. So I support Governor Wolf's initiatives to properly fund public education in Pennsylvania. And the third one, sort of an oddball one, fair districts. I know I've, we could refer to uh, near Congressman Scott on this one, where I remember two years ago, we all had these districts we were working in, and then right before petition signing started, whoop, all the petition, or all the <laughs> congressional districts got redrawn, and I'm glad they were. They had to be redrawn, because the old congressional districts were so corrupt 
The Republicans drew them in 2010 so they could control who was in Congress representing you, not the voters in Pennsylvania controlling who we sent to Congress. So, thank you very much. Okay, we will now go to the questions from the audience. A reminder to the candidates, there are only, you only get one minute. So we did not do a coin toss for all five of the candidates, so I'm going to make an arbitrary decision here and start from with the candidate to my immediate right, dear Congressman Scott. <laughs> the, um, we have had several references here to the minimum wage. Specifically, in one minute, what exactly would you do about the minimum wage? And even more specifically, should we end the lower minimum wage for tipped workers? So I'll address the second part first. Uh, yes, we should uh, eliminate the lower minimum wage for tipped workers. And in terms of the minimum wage, we need to get to $15 an hour. We need to do that in increments so that particularly small businesses are not put out of work by this. My, my wife's a small business owner. I know many other small business owners. To go from 725 to 15 would be catastrophic for them. But I think what we can do is raise it to $10 an hour here in 2020 and raise it $1 an hour every year for five years, and then we're going to be at $15 an hour in five years. It's an easy, easy one to remember, um, easy one to implement, and I think that it's something that, as, as others have mentioned, when you raise a minimum wage, you raise the wage of others as well, and then that goes straight into the economy and stimulates our economy because the because marginal propensity to consume, as the cops will tell you, is, is very high at those who are in the lowest wages. Alvin? As a person who is not a politician, I'm a practical person. As I said, I am you. <laughs> Education has always been the key. I believe in it. Education dictates your earnings. If you don't have the education, you don't know your own potential. One of the things I learned early on working for the federal government is the, the economy moves off of our income. We have to do something radical. The governor has it within his ability right now to do an executive order for $15 an hour. It's within his power. We also can tax those businesses that do fracking in our state and don't charge any money for what they extract out of the ground. As an old church pastor of 44 years, when there's something that needs to be done and the budget doesn't allow for it, we move one thing around and we'll do something else. Uh, in a word, Yes, we need to increase the minimum wage. I'll absolutely echo what's been said before and what will likely be said very soon. Uh, $15 an hour is, is the fight, is the goal. We can absolutely attain that. But my fear is, when's the best time to increase the minimum wage? And the correct answer to that is, when's the best time to plant a tree? Well, the answer is 10 years ago. We didn't do it 10 years ago. Okay, when's the second best time to do it? Right now, today, starting right now, going forward. Get the minimum wage increased to $15 as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, yes, I support the governor's plan uh, and the plan put forth by We the People. Um, I know a lot of folks that are members of Capital Region Stands Up are familiar with the We the People platform, which calls to raise the minimum wage to $12 an hour and then incrementally to $15. Uh, this is what our governor supports. And as a member of the state senate, that is what I would support as well. I've done legislative visits. I actually had a meeting with Senator DeSanto over the summer where he laughed at us and said that um, only teenagers get the minimum wage and they're not even worth that. So we have to replace the folks who are making these decisions. I don't think you can find a working person who doesn't believe the minimum wage should be raised. Not just for teenagers, but because a large percentage of those people are working moms. They're not all teenagers, so yes, we need to do that. Uh, and of course, the minimum wage would apply to everyone. Tipped workers should still get tips, but they should also be making at least $15 an hour. I believe in the people of Pennsylvania that we would continue to tip our service workers because they are miracle workers, and we need to do it now. 
Thank you. Another excellent question. I'm going to echo some of the things you've heard. Say, number one, I'm absolutely supportive of increasing the minimum wage to $12 now. As, as has been mentioned, Governor Wolf is obviously supportive of that. I think it's interesting to note, because we look ahead to November, I was quite surprised that our good Senator Regan actually voted for, in November, a, a raise to $9.50 an hour. I was pleasantly surprised. But I know he only did that because his Republican minders told him to. If next year they told him, tell him not to, he's going to not do it. So I've already given a little bit of the economic argument. We all recognize, and you've heard very eloquently here before, all the good reasons why we should raise the minimum wage. I'm also going to highlight, so what's the purpose of this? What are we really trying to achieve? It's obviously to raise the incomes for families and create family sustaining wages. So my point is, of course, that minimum wage is just a first step. It's all about education, career training, incentive programs, and helping our people you know, to raise themselves up and raise their incomes so minimum wage becomes irrelevant. Thank you. Rick, why don't you hold on to the microphone and we'll start with you <laughs> rather than handing it all the way across. The, uh, this question, I'm going to combine two questions here, and we, a reminder, it is one minute. Uh, what is your view on environmental damage in Pennsylvania, specifically on fracking, air, wa air water quality, and the climate crisis? In one minute. Fracking, air water quality, and the climate crisis. So I would highlight once again that this is a, cre a key priority for me. I put it up as one of my key platform items, so this is not marginal. And in all those areas, clearly there's been damage done and there are things that need to be accomplished. With regard to fracking, I would highlight that undoubtedly we'd all like to we'd like to ban it overnight, but that's not realistic. I think we have to have a transitional program where we're we're moving away from fracking and we're moving toward. I'm sure everyone here is going to support a strong green environment and all the jobs that come with that. So that's where I stand on fracking. With regard to climate change, clearly it's a good thing that Pennsylvania didn't listen to the President of the United States who withdrew us from the Paris Climate Agreement so that we are still in Pennsylvania supportive of that agreement and everything that that means. So undoubtedly those are important uh, things and I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, very important topic. Sure. Uh, thank you, I think there's a lot we can do. Again, we would all like to end fracking. We can't do it overnight, but I think we see the devastation. I mentioned earlier, I lived in uh, McKean County for a long time where fracking was happening all over the place. I was behind those trucks on my commute to work every morning. And that has kind of devastated those economies. They came in with these promises of we're gonna bring jobs and it'll be you know, thriving communities and it didn't happen. Most of the people working those jobs came from out of state and as soon as the wells are done, they're gone. So we need to transition away from fracking as soon as possible, but in the interim to clean our air and water, we can do things like stop giving tax breaks to logistics companies. Uh, those trucking companies that are all over the uh, 81 and 83 corridors, they don't need tax breaks. Um, Anti-idling laws and higher standards for emissions and doing more for EV infrastructure, just like Harrisburg, just put in new charging stations right in front of the museum. We can do that in all of our communities. We need to move to renewable resources as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. As someone who has solar panels on my own house, it's something we can do <coughs> quickly and efficiently. Uh, Senate Bill 600 is one of the, the two bills that's on the table right now that I would fully support. It calls for 30% renewable resource usage in the next 10 years by 2030. That's something we can do. Uh, Senate Bill 630 is also on the table right now, and that's sort of the conclusion to Senate Bill 600. It requires 100% usage of renewable resources by 2050. I feel by 30 years from now, we should be able to do that. Personally, I feel we should be able to do that quicker than 30 years. If we can't do it in 15 or 20, it's our environment that we're failing. It's our children, it's our grandchildren that we're leaving it to. I have said many times as an ordinary person, you have to confront people and do the drastic cuts, the drastic decisions. When you say you want to start out at a, say a $10, they will negotiate down to eight. It's no real win for anyone. If we move the economy at $15 an hour, 
it will start people spending money, which will have other benefits in other segments. Yes, small business does get hurt. My father was a small businessman. My uncle was a small businessman. But when the economy changed, they had to retool. And what we're telling our population right now is we can't retool. But if you look at our young people, they are making money in the technological realm that we never imagined. We're still doing eight track and cassette tape. And they are downloading <laughs> songs overnight. And they're multi-millionaires. <laughs> so environmental damage is a serious issue. When we think about this, particularly as a case of fracking, the original concept was that the impact fees were going to cover the costs of the environmental damage. And while they have been an economic stimulus in some of the local communities, they have certainly not addressed the economic damage that has been, or environmental damage that has been caused. So I would support moving towards implementation of, a, of an extraction tax. Pennsylvania is the only state in the United States that does not have an extraction tax on fracking. Uh, there's no reason for us to do that, particularly when we're one of the top five producers of natural gas from this process. In addition to that, we need to enforce the anti-idling laws, as was mentioned. We need to make sure that we are implementing the recommendations that our Auditor General put out recently in his report, which is very comprehensive, and I encourage you to look at it. It details not only the costs of, um, of the lack of, uh, of good laws and good legislation, but the costs from environmental pollution, but also the ways to address them. Okay, we have one more question, and I think we, why don't we start with Alvin and, um, and go from there. In fact, why don't we do it this way, just for logistics purposes. Alvin to George, and then back to John, just so we don't have the microphone being passed all the way down the end of the table. Um, here, is, uh, here is your question. What is your position on criminal justice reform in Pennsylvania? In particular, mandatory minimum sentencing, mass incarceration, and incarceration of elderly and infirm inmates. And a reminder, it is one minute. We had uh, the commissioner, John Wenzel, to come to our minister's conference here in February. And there's a big problem in the pipeline system of this uh, penal reform and all of that. They have a prison just for senior citizens who have aged out their, their, their nursing home prisons. We have to do something about that. We are not rehabbing inmates. We're not educating them. We need to work on something different that will work. That was the whole premise of what he said. He was on 60 Minutes talking about how much we spend on incarceration. It's more than what we spend on sending people to college. We have to do some readjusting these minimums that they, they require. We got to look at that again with new eyes and new vision. So in criminal justice reform, we need to move away from a system that has a retributive justice where we're focused on punishment and move towards a system that is focused on restorative justice, that gives people the ability to move out and up of, of choices that frankly they didn't want to be in in the first place. And so we need to, to bring an end to mandatory minimums and ensure that the decisions on sentencing are left with judges who are the ones best qualified and most aware of the individual circumstances of each case. In terms of mass incarceration, we need to move away from that, fortunately, Pennsylvania already is doing that under the Secretary Wetzel, but he pointed out the other day in an interview that it's still, his department is the third largest consumer of state revenue in Pennsylvania. And obviously our elderly inmates, we need to find a way to release them back into society. Um, there's no need for them to be there. They have no danger to society. I agree that we need reform and we need it fairly quickly here. Uh, one of the first things I would do is end mandatory minimums. Uh, in addition to that, I would also decriminalize possession of marijuana. And I know that might be a little controversial, but I feel that if our prisons are being overcrowded, that's about the least offensive offense that there is out there. 
Uh, that's one surefire way to limit our prison population is by decriminalizing possession of marijuana. Uh, one of the stats that Alvin had touched on, the same amount of money it takes to house someone in a prison for a year is the, is the exact cost of tuition at tuition room and board at Penn State for a year. Feel that a way to avoid prison costs on the back end is to fund education on the front end. If we properly fund public education, maybe we wouldn't have a prison situation down the road. Can I get you to read the question, please? There were a bunch of parts to that that I don't want to leave out. So. What is your position on criminal justice reform in Pennsylvania? In particular, mandatory minimum sentencing, mass incarceration, and incarceration of elderly and infirm inmates. Okay, so we should not be putting elderly people in prison. There are other places and other ways to help rehabilitate folks and give them the support that they need to live their lives like the rest of us. Uh, mandatory minimums are not helpful for anyone for any offense because a lot of times they are disproportionately punishing communities of color who are already being punished in pretty much every way you can imagine for things that are not necessarily their fault. If we're raising the minimum wage, if we're investing in public education, if we are not only legalizing medical and recreational marijuana, but taxing them and then using that revenue to clean the environment, to fund public education, we wouldn't have the, uh, the high population of folks incarcerated to begin with. Uh, we should not have private prisons. Private prisons are receiving an inordinate amount of state funding, and this is not an acceptable use of our money. And I absolutely want to echo what George said about restorative justice and actually helping folks who are incarcerated to get the services and the education they need to be, come back and be productive members of society. I just want to thank whoever put that question on the table because it is a superb question, and I'm going to echo up. I mean, I don't think I've heard any comment so far that I disagree with because they're all very good comments and very appropriate. And it all goes to, you know, what's the whole intent and purpose of our criminal justice system, and justice being the key phrase there. And what are we really trying to do? And that goes to our mindsets. Are we trying to hurt people? Because if, if we are, then I think we're doing that pretty effect effectively right now. And, and as, as hasn't been mentioned, unfortunately this impacts our communities of color most of all, and that's absolutely inappropriate. So I take the concept of the, the overarching view of what can we do to help these folks? Obviously, in some cases, they've made mistakes. They have made mistakes, but, but we, we live in a community, I hope, where we're willing to give people a second chance. So all those things that you've heard mentioned in terms of mandatory minimums, yep, agree that that's not, and certainly we don't need to be putting elderly people in jail and keeping them there. Uh, and all the other things you heard, I'm supportive of. So thank you very much as my time expires. <laughs> And the time expires for the Senate portion of, uh, of this uh, forum today. Uh, join with me in, uh, in thanking the members. I thought they were